Hello everybody, welcome to the start of another vlog. This is the vlog that I am creating in response to the Can I Trust Sarah video that I made a couple of weeks ago where Sarah recommended me three books that she knew were on my TBR and that she wanted me to read. And so now I have just picked up the very first book and that is Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll. I just started it this morning. I've listened to maybe two hours total and y'all, I am absolutely loving the way that this story is being told so far. The way the story is told is reminding me a lot of how My Dear Hamilton and America's First Daughter by Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy were told. I would classify those books as historical fiction with an autobiographical narrative because those books were told from the perspective of Eliza Hamilton and Patsy Jefferson and they were told as though those women were telling you their story. And this story is told very similarly, only this story is told from the perspective of Pamela. And Pamela was the chapter president of the sorority that Ted Bundy attacked on his very last killing spree prior to being arrested and executed. Now I should say that I do not know if any of the names have been changed in here so I do not know if Pamela was a real person like I don't know if that's her actual name that's just the perspective that we are getting. To my knowledge Ted Bundy is never actually named within this book because it's not about him it's about his victims but we all know as readers what it's about and what it's regarding and we of course know who committed these crimes we know all the things that he did prior to committing these crimes and we know what ended up happening to him but Pamela in this story does not. All she knows is that somebody broke into our sorority and killed some of her friends and now she is a first-hand witness to all of the stuff that is going down. And so we are getting her first person account of what went down that night. And I cannot even tell you how engaging and compelling this is, y'all. Jessica Knoll has just created this really engaging narrative style. And I appreciated that she is telling the story from Pamela's perspective, her first person perspective of what actually happened. So it's making you feel like you were there and you were actually witnessing what was happening. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to come on here really quickly and open the blog and tell you what I'm starting with, how much I'm enjoying it so far. I'm very excited to continue. I'm going to try to give you at least three updates for every book when I start it in the middle and at the end. But yeah, that's going to be the structure for this vlog. I'm very excited to continue with this book and the other two that Sarah has chosen for me. And I'm also excited to bring you along with me. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and head into work and I will catch up with you when I'm about at the midpoint of this book. Hey everybody. So I'm actually just getting ready to film some videos, but I thought that I would pop on here really quick because I have now surpassed the 50% mark of Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll. And I'm still really, really enjoying this, although it has slowed down a bit for me. So shortly after my initial update, our main narrator, Pamela, meets a woman named Tina. And you find out that Tina is actually from Washington, but she flew out to kind of help support the victims of the sorority killings because she believes that the same man is responsible for those killings as killed her friend Ruth back in Washington. And so you're following her as she's developing a relationship with Pamela. They're trying to prove that the same person was the killer because police have their sights set on one of the victim's boyfriends. And and Pamela knows that that's not the case because she actually saw who did the killings and she believes that it is the person that Tina showed her in a photograph. So you're kind of following them as they're doing a little bit of their own investigating, trying to get to the bottom of who actually did all of these killings. And then you're also now getting the perspective of Ruth. So this book is now narrated by two people. We have Pamela in 1978 and then we have Ruth in 1974. And we are also getting snippets of Pamela in 2021, which is the present day timeline in this. She has been summoned back to Tallahassee for some reason. At this point, I don't believe we know why she has been summoned there, but she has been summoned to see somebody in a prison in Tallahassee, if I'm understanding this correctly. And I'm sure that we are going to uncover what is happening in the present day timeline. But basically from the present, she is kind of narrating her experiences in 1978 with Tina after the massacre at the sorority. And then, like I said, you are now getting Ruth's perspective. So once Ruth's perspective was introduced into the story, it definitely slowed down for me a little bit just because I was so invested in the experience that Pamela was having having. And I wanted to continue on that journey with the investigation and her and Tina, you know, trying to figure things out. And again, from what I'm understanding, Ruth was eventually a victim of the defendant. That's how he's referred to throughout this book. Like I said, he is never actually named. We as readers know he is Ted Bundy, but he is never given that attention in the story. All I know is that I'm definitely a little bit more invested in Pamela's perspective than I am in Ruth's. And also, to be honest with you, I am listening to this book. And even though they are narrated by two completely separate people, I am kind of getting their perspectives confused at some point, especially because Tina is involved in both of them. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to parse out who I'm listening to and what is actually happening, especially since some of their locations overlap. Like currently, both of these characters are in Aspen, one in 1974 and one in 1978. So there is a little bit of difficulty for me there. But overall, I still am very much enjoying this. I'm very much appreciating the very character driven aspects of this story. And I'm very intrigued to see what happens. I'm hoping that there's an author's note at the end of this just kind of explaining how she wrote the story, why she chose 
was this any inaccuracies that she put in here because I really want to know like if these were based around real people if what happened in this story actually happened in real life and and all of that stuff so yes very solid reading experience so far and I'm looking forward to completing it I should actually if all goes according to plan I should be finishing this by tonight because I have maybe about two and a half hours of listening time left so that's the plan with this one and I'm very much looking forward to finishing it hello friends I am just about to head into work but I wanted to go ahead and come on here and wrap up my final thoughts about Bright Young Women by Jessica Knowles because I did finish it yesterday as expected. I'm settling on a solid four stars for this. I thought that this was incredibly well written and I really appreciated what Jessica Knowles was doing with this story. With regard to Ruth's perspective, I kind of still stand by my feelings that I wasn't nearly as interested in her perspective as I was with Pamela's, but I will say that Ruth's perspective was absolutely 100% necessary because Ruth gave a face and a voice to Ted Bundy's victims. Ted Bundy undoubtedly has gotten an infinite amount of attention and his victims have hardly gotten any. But with Ruth's perspective, you realize that these were real women. These were women that were loved and who loved and who could have done amazing things with their lives, but their light was cut way too short because a wretched human thought that he had the right to do that. And I will say that there's something incredibly dark and unnerving about reading from the perspective of a character you know is going to die. Like, you know Ruth's fate from the time that she becomes a perspective in this story. And there's something really harrowing about that. And so I absolutely applaud and give props to Jessica Knoll for what she was able to do with Ruth's character. And then again, for what she was able to do with this story in general. Everybody was always so charmed by Ted Bundy because of how handsome he was and how charming they thought that he was and how smart and clever. But Jessica Knoll actually made a lot of really good points in this story about how Ted Bundy might have been handsome and charming, but he ultimately was not really all that smart and clever. There were several moments throughout this whole time where he made a complete ass out of himself, especially within the courtroom. And like, if you think about it, this was a guy who couldn't pass college. He couldn't get into law school. And so when you're bringing attention to that, it really puts him in a different perspective. So I really feel like the perspective that Jessica Knoll gave was a really refreshing and really needed one. I was actually watching a vlog recently from Leanne over at Literary Diversions, and she happened to be reading this book within the vlog. And she made a really excellent point on the way that it was written about how it felt like a very good combination of thriller slash true crime. And that really resonated with me because there was always something about this writing that I couldn't place. And that was exactly it. Because the perspectives of Pamela and Ruth are incredibly distinct. It's very much Pamela's perspective that feels like a nonfiction true crime narrative. And then Ruth's perspective was definitely more personal. It was definitely more in line with the traditional character-driven thriller narrative that you might expect from the story. So I thought that it was incredibly interesting the way that Jessica Knoll chose to write the story and she pulled it off very, very well. But at the same time, the way this was written added a sense of dissonance to my overall reading experience. Since it felt so much like a true crime, I found myself wanting to like Google all of the things that I was reading about, but I had no idea what was actually fully fiction in the story, what was based on real events, etc. And for that, I really feel like we needed an author's note, which we did not get to my knowledge. There is no author's note. And I was waiting for that. And I really feel as though a story like this deserves that extra context and we just didn't get it. And so by the end of the story, I just found myself wanting a little bit more. And because of that, as well as the fact that I never really felt emotionally connected to the story, I was definitely interested and I was invested and I wanted to know what was going to happen. And like I said, I certainly feel as though this was very well written because this lacked an emotional attachment for me. I think that a four star is definitely the rating that I'm going to go with. But like I said, this was extremely well written. It's definitely worth the read and it's an important read. And so I'm very glad that I decided to go ahead and put this on my TBR. And I'm very glad that Sarah decided to choose it for me. So the first book in this project was definitely a success. And I'm very excited to move on to the next ones. I don't know when that's going to be, but I'm very, very much looking forward to them. So I will check in with you when I have started the next book. Hi friends, I am coming at you looking like a hot mess just because I got done at work and I'm now headed into the gym. But before I did that, I wanted to come on here and quickly let you know that I have started the next book in this project and that is Life's Too Short by Abby Jimenez. This is the final book that I need to read in order to have completed all of Abby Jimenez's published works and this is the final book in the Friend Zone series. So I'm very, very excited to be getting to it. So I'm very early days into this book. I started it on my commute to work this morning and then there's only a 15 minute drive between my work and my gym. So I've maybe listened to, I want to say like an hour and 15 minutes. So still very early on in the story. But as usual, there are some of the standard trademark things that you typically find in an Abby Jimenez book so far. And I'm enjoying it. This follows our two main characters. We have Vanessa and Adrian, I think is the name of the male love interest. And Vanessa has recently found herself in an unfortunate situation. Her younger sister who has some drug addiction problems. She's only 19. She recently had a baby and she came by Vanessa's apartment and said that she was going to go out running an errand, left the baby with Vanessa and never came back. So basically, 
basically Vanessa is now an unexpected foster parent. She's got legal custody of the baby whose name is Grace and she's kind of trying to adjust to life as a new parent, especially since prior to this, she was a travel influencer. So she's used to going all over the world. So on top of having to adjust to being a new mom, she also has to adjust to what it's doing to her career and how to kind of make content when her life looks very, very different. And we are also now following Adrian and I don't feel like we know too terribly much about him. We know that he's a pretty successful criminal defense attorney and he actually owns the building that he lives in right next door to Vanessa. And near the beginning of the story, he's been in a long distance eight month relationship with a woman and he finds out that she's married and they break up. So he's going through a rough time as well. And our two main characters are meeting because the baby won't stop crying. And so in the middle of the night, he goes over there, he takes control of the baby and he's like, go take a shower. So he's very all take charge and control over it. He's like, I need to get some sleep. This baby will not stop crying. Can you please just go take a shower? I'll try to calm her down. And it kind of goes from there. I am now at a scene where he is over back at her apartment. They are having dinner together and they are kind of getting to know each other. And yeah, I'm looking forward to getting more into it. Anyway, y'all, it is starting to rain. And so I better run into the gym before I get poured on. So I will catch up with you when I've gotten at least halfway through Life's Too Short. Hi, everybody. I am just on my way to work, but I am nearing the end of Life's Too Short. I have about two hours of listening time left and my goal is still to finish it today. So hopefully I can. So I kind of wanted to come on here and give you a mid book check-in. So since my last update, we have definitely learned a lot more about the characters, primarily Vanessa. So not only has she just had this baby dropped on her, but she's also dealing with a lot of serious family issues. But on top of that, she's also concerned that she is dying of ALS. Her older sister died of ALS. It definitely runs in the family and she is noticing some symptoms that seems to indicate that she could possibly have it. So she's really just trying to do what she can to prepare for the end of her life. And she really doesn't think it's fair to like start dating anyone or having a relationship or anything. So even though she's definitely attracted to Adrian and she flirts with him and all of this stuff, she's really not willing to go any further with Adrian just because she doesn't think it's fair to him. For Adrian's part, we still really don't know all that much about him, to be honest. I really haven't learned much more about him since my last update. We do know that he and his mom now have a strained relationship. Apparently she married a man that he really doesn't care for. Something happened that kind of got between them and now he's kind of refusing to have a relationship with her. But that's really all the development that we've gotten in Adrian's character. So this is definitely more heavily focused on Vanessa, in my opinion. So we're kind of currently following Adrian and Vanessa as they're definitely growing closer. They're spending a lot more time together. They're very much fully entrenched in each other's lives. And you can see kind of like mutual pining happening. Adrian definitely wants to be with Vanessa. He's attracted to her. He's very much falling for her. And kind of the same on Vanessa's part. And I'm sure that it's all going to come to a head later on in the story. So I am definitely having a really, really good time with this story. I'm very much loving the characters as per usual, but unfortunately I'm not emotionally connected to this one. I mean, there's still two hours of listening time. I guess there's every possibility that this could break my heart like most other Abby Jimenez's do. But for the most part, I feel like we were kind of thrown into this relationship between Vanessa and Adrian. I feel like it all came about rather quickly. And I don't really feel like even though we are getting to know them and we are following them, I don't really feel like I've gotten an opportunity to emotionally invest in them or their relationship. I'm still hoping that by the end of this, Just for the Summer remains my least favorite Abby Jimenez because I was really going into this confident that I was going to enjoy it a lot more. And that's not necessarily the case so far, despite how much I'm enjoying the characters. So we're going to see. I will give you an update as soon as I finish the book. All right, everyone. I wanted to come on here and give you my final thoughts on Life's Too Short, which I did finish yesterday while I was getting ready for work. And in full transparency, I did attempt to film this wrap up like three or four different times, but I couldn't seem to articulate my thoughts and feelings on this because there are a lot. And unfortunately, they are not super positive. So I think in my last clip, I mentioned that one of the main problems I was having with the story was that I was not feeling that same emotional connection that I typically feel from an Abby Jimenez book, right? I wasn't really connecting with the main characters or their relationships. And I thought that as we got towards the end of the book, when we were dealing with the more harder hitting elements, which in this case is ALS, and I'll talk more about that in a second, I thought that I was fully going to start getting into the emotional side of this. And unfortunately, that just was not the case. And I think the reason for that is just because of the pacing of the story. I feel like this went entirely too fast for what it should have been or what I wanted it to be. So our main characters, Vanessa and Adrian, they've lived next to each other in side by side apartments for God knows how long, never meeting, never interacting until that one night that Adrian goes over to help Vanessa with a crying grace, right? He needs some sleep. He needs the baby to stop crying. So he goes over to help her. And then almost instantaneously, they become inextricably intertwined in each other's lives. Soon they're exchanging keys to each other's apartments. They're having movie and dinner nights. Adrian is consistently watching Grace for Vanessa and things like that. So they become best friends like instantaneously. But of course, there's definitely a mutual attraction between them. And Abby Jimenez is trying to give you the appearance of slow burn here because both of them are so adamant about not dating. Vanessa feels like she has ALS and she doesn't think it's fair to start dating anybody because she could die soon. And then Adrian has just gotten out of this bad relationship and he is not really ready to date. So Abby Jimenez unfortunately relies on that trope where both of the main characters are so incredibly dense and obtuse to the other person's feelings. They're like, oh no, this person could not possibly feel the same way about me as I do about them. Despite all 
evidence to the contrary, despite their friends telling them, dude, she's totally into you or vice versa. And that's the only reason why you get the appearance of slow burn, because once they actually admit that they have feelings for each other, it essentially goes from nothing to serious relationship within the span of a night. And I'm not kidding. I actually found out towards the end of the story that all of this, from the time that they actually meet to the time they become boyfriend and girlfriend, only takes about a month. And so it was ramped up the entirety of the story. And that was just a little bit too fast for my taste. I don't feel like we got the development that I wanted in this relationship. I never felt the emotional connection to both of them or their relationship. Now, that's not to say that I didn't necessarily have a good time while reading this story because I did. I love Abby Jimenez's writing and I do typically feel like she writes good love interests for the most part. Although I will say that Adrian is probably my least favorite male love interest to date and I'm going to get into more of that as well in a second. But I still had an ultimately good time reading this one. I found myself laughing and giggling throughout the story. So this wasn't a total loss. There were just so many issues that I had with the story that could not be overlooked. So Vanessa's whole thing is ALS, right? Her sister died from ALS. Her mother would have died from ALS had she not died in a car accident prior. So there is a 50-50 shot that Vanessa could die from ALS. And Adrian conveniently does not know this, even though that's the whole point of Vanessa's YouTube channel. Like, you know, she wants to live like she's dying. So she's an incredibly famous travel influencer. And a lot of the money that she makes, she donates it to charitable organizations or research foundations who are looking for a cure for ALS. That's her whole thing. She talks about it on her channel constantly. But of course, Adrian doesn't watch her channel, which is super convenient because of course, as soon as he finds out about this, and as soon as he finds out that Vanessa has opted not to seek treatment, he completely explodes. He does not handle it well. Vanessa has taken charge of her own death. She wants to die on her own terms, and she doesn't want to seek treatment that she knows will only extend her life for about three months. And on top of that, there is no test for ALS. Doctors essentially have to rule out every other thing that could potentially present as ALS before you're given a diagnosis for ALS. So she would have to be poked and prodded for weeks and months in order just to get this diagnosis to get a treatment that won't even really prolong her life. And she just has opted not to do that. You know, if she's only going to live for a short amount of time, she wants to live on her own terms and she wants to die on her own terms. And Adrian cannot accept that. He essentially gives her an ultimatum and says, I need to know that you were going to fight and that you were going to seek treatment to live as long as possible because I cannot sit around and watch you die. And she basically calls him on that bluff. And of course, it leads to a third act breakup. And one that I actually completely understood because I did not love the way that Adrian handled this. But I also didn't necessarily think that the third act breakup should have been there in the first place because had Adrian just paid attention to her channel or what Vanessa had been saying to him this whole time about her legitimate fears about having ALS, which he completely disregarded because he thought it was random and that she was worrying for nothing, this all could have been avoided. This could have been completely avoided. So I really didn't love the way Adrian handled this. And like I said, he's one of my least favorite male love interests for this reason. And again, this is another reason why I just couldn't connect to their overall relationship. And I am going to go ahead and talk about the ending. I'm going to spoil the ending here because I don't feel like I can fully adequately talk about my feelings about this book without spoiling the ending. So we get to the ending. And of course, Vanessa doesn't have ALS after all. Despite her being adamant about not seeking a diagnosis or treatment, she goes to the doctor and turns out that the weakness of her grip and the tingling she was getting in her arm was actually just a cyst that was pressing on a nerve. So everything is completely and totally fine. Now she could get ALS in the future for sure, but she doesn't have it now. So there is every opportunity for her to have a happily ever after with Adrian. And I know that we all go into these stories for that happily ever after. And I have read every single other one of Abby Jimenez's book. So I should have known that this was the direction that this was headed. However, I feel like Abby Jimenez likes to resort to these cop out endings rather than delivering on what she's been promising throughout the whole story. The friend zone was a lot like this as well. I don't want to go too much into it because I did do a very in-depth and lengthy explanation of my feelings on that book and like one of the reading roundups that I did. I'll try to remember to leave it linked down below just in case you were interested. Now did I want to see Vanessa struggle and hurt and go through ALS? Absolutely not. I don't necessarily think I would have loved to see that on the page. However, just kind of knowing that that was going to ultimately be the result, I think would have added a lot more depth and substance to this story and would potentially have boosted my reading experience with this. But as it happened, Abby Jimenez did a cop-out ending. Of course it's not ALS. Of course Vanessa, despite her protestations, goes to the doctor. She gets a diagnosis. It's not ALS. She's completely fine. She gets to live out this happily ever after, despite the whole entirety of the story being based on the fact that she does or thinks she does have ALS. I found myself very, very frustrated with that. And it's not something that I could overlook. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think that this is my least favorite Abby Jimenez. And that completely blows my mind, y'all, because I was not expecting that at all. I was confident that this was going to be one of my new favorites. This is the epitome of a five star prediction and it completely let me down. Considering how much I love the other two books in the series, there was nothing in my mind that told me that I was not going to love this just as much, if not more than those other two books. And unfortunately I didn't. And so that's making me a little bit nervous because I've had two back to back Abby Jimenez duds. And that makes me really wonder about my experiences with her other books. It's entirely possible that some of her romances are just going to work better for me than the others. And I still stand by the fact that part of your world is one of my favorite romances of all time. But unfortunately, this just did not work for me the way that 
that I wanted it to the way that I was expecting it to. I'm so terribly sorry, Sarah. This was the one out of all the others that I was for sure I was going to like the most and it just didn't hit for me like the other Abby Jimenez books that I read. Hello everybody. It is time for the last few updates of this vlog because I have started the final book, The Dream Daughter by Diane Chamberlain. I apologize if I'm looking like a hot mess right now. I just got home from work. I did not go to the gym today because I have been experiencing some pretty bad hip issues. I have no idea what is going on and it's now really to the point where I can't even try to justify going to the gym because it hurts so badly and I'm not going to be able to do the majority of the movements. So anyway, that's not why you're here. You are here for an update. So like I mentioned, I have started the final book for this vlog, which is Diane Chamberlain's The Dream Daughter. And I'm honestly a good chunk of the way through this book already. I don't necessarily know if I've hit the halfway point, but I'm very close if I haven't already. I started it yesterday and I'm really enjoying it. It is no surprise that I'm enjoying it. I've always found Diane Chamberlain's books to be very compulsively readable, fascinating and interesting. And this one actually plays with time travel. So in this story, we're following two main characters. You're following Carly. It is 1970. Her husband has recently been killed in Vietnam and she is now about five months pregnant. And she gets told by the doctors that her baby has a heart condition and it's likely that as soon as she's born, she's gonna die. And obviously Carly is absolutely devastated because her husband is gone and now the last piece of her husband is going to be gone as well. But Hunter, her brother-in-law, lets her in on a secret. He says, hey, I am from the future. I was actually born in 1986 and I time traveled back here for a specific reason and I decided not to leave when I met your sister and I fell in love and I believe that there's a surgery that can help your baby in the future in 2001. Needless to say Carly is not having any of it. She thinks that Hunter is going through some kind of psychotic break but he manages to convince her and he manages to get her to 2001 to his mother. His mother is a scientist and she has this business that is kind of centered around time travel as crazy as it sounds. So we're now to the point where Carly is in 2001 and obviously there is a lot to adjust to. She obviously doesn't know what a computer or a cell phone is. She's having to learn all of this stuff and she's very, very out of place, but she's doing everything that she can to save her baby. And so we're now getting to the point where she's having a consult with the surgeons to see if there's actually anything that can be done. And yeah, I'm honestly just having a really good time. I'm really enjoying it. I want to see what happens. I want to see if Carly's able to save her baby. I want to see what the ultimate like objective of the story is. Like I feel something more has to happen than just Carly going into the future to save her baby. You know, I feel like there's probably some overall big bigger plot that maybe I haven't discovered yet or I could I could be entirely wrong I don't know but we're gonna see I will definitely come on here and give at least one more check-in with my thoughts but so far I am absolutely loving this book hey everyone so it is actually the next day I'm on my way into work it's going to be a very very busy day but I wanted to come on here really quickly because I vastly overestimated how quickly I was going to be done with the story I thought that I was much further into it than I was but I woke up this morning and I still had almost four hours of listening time I forgot that this book was like a 13 hour long audiobook and apparently I thought that I was way closer to finishing it than I was so needless to say I probably will not be finishing this today. So I just kind of wanted to pop on here and give a couple extra thoughts because I feel like we've kind of hit a little bit of a lag. It's picking up again now but we definitely hit a lag because once the main character has her baby there is a seemingly endless array of complications right. We think that she's getting better and then the baby has a fever and has to go back into the hospital or the baby has bleeding and has to go back into the hospital. So there's things over and over and over again that are causing the baby to go back to the hospital and she was only given a limited amount of portals in order to get back right her brother-in-law he's able to calculate when the portals are going to open and he's given her a handful of them and she's now reached the last one and she doesn't make it right so it's definitely lagging at this point and it's a little bit more difficult for me just because y'all know that I'm not the biggest fan of stories that are surrounding children so I'm having a hard time like relating to the character and what she's going through because she's basically like obsessed with staying in the hospital being with her baby and it's like okay can we get a move on with the story can we just like move on. This is getting a little bit redundant. It's getting a little bit repetitive. I get it. Let's just move on. But also I'm a little bit frustrated by the lack of forethought of these characters. You have a woman who's told that her baby has a severe heart issue and that without this fetal surgery, this baby is going to die shortly after birth. What on earth made these people think that she was going to be ready within a matter of weeks to leave 2001 and go back to 1970? It's absolutely absurd to me. And not only that, but there was likely going to be several follow-up appointments that were needed for this baby. You can't have a complicated health issue like this, one that needs to be fixed with 21st century technology, and then quickly be ready to go back in time to 1970. So I think there was a distinct lack of forethought with these characters, and actually Hunter just said that. He's like, I cannot believe I didn't think this through. But what you're getting here is Diane Chamberlain trying to find a way to make this plot need to go on, to add a little bit more suspense and intrigue. 
So I get why Diane Chamberlain did it, but it was certainly very, very convenient of this to happen. Right, so that was a little bit frustrating. And like I said, there is a little bit of a lag just because we spend so many weeks with Carly in the hospital with her baby and it's just starting to pick up again. So I'm still very much enjoying it. I still find this very compelling, very interesting. Of course, I love Diane Chamberlain and her writing. And I just think that she comes up with such unique and interesting ideas. And so I just wanted to come on here and share those last few thoughts before I finish the book. Now, I definitely must be going into work because it's going to be nuts. I think that I have officially started the busiest next four months of my life and it's it's gonna be wild y'all so pray for me anyway I'll check in with you when I finish the dream daughter hello friends I am currently here on my lunch break at work I'm sorry if you can hear the car and the air conditioning in the background but it is about 100 degrees outside right now and there is no way I can sit out in my car and give you an update unless the air conditioning is on but I did finally finish the dream daughter yesterday evening while I was making dinner and so I wanted to come on here and give you my final thoughts so I really really liked this book it was incredibly compelling as most Diane Chamberlain's are it was definitely well written it was incredible engaging and it was certainly such a unique concept. I really enjoyed what Diane Chamberlain was able to do with time travel in this book. I liked the rules that she made and the concepts and everything like that. So overall, this was a very positive reading experience for me, which I'm not surprised by because I have enjoyed immensely every single other Diane Chamberlain that I've read. I do have my technical issues with it. I do feel like this book was too long. I feel like because of that, it suffered from pacing issues. I feel like if Diane Chamberlain had reduced this by, I don't know, like maybe around 50 or so pages, it would have flowed a lot better and I would have been able to keep my momentum. I will say that I do feel like this book relies heavily on the reader being able to relate to or fully understand the love and dedication a mother has for their child because that's really what this story is about, right? This is about Carly who's in 1970. She's told that her baby is going to die shortly after she is born and then she is told that in 2001 there is advanced fetal surgery that could potentially save her baby's life. But then it gets even more dramatic after that and some of the decisions that Carly makes, I found myself incredibly frustrated with her at points because because she was willing to do whatever, regardless of how reckless or regardless of how it affected anybody else in order to save or be near her child. And while logically I can understand that and get behind it, it's not something that I necessarily emotionally feel. So when those instances were happening in the story, I was just very frustrated. I can't really say more about it just because it would be spoilers for things that happen later on in the book, but there were definitely moments in the story where I was increasingly frustrated with Carly and some of her behavior going on in here. But ultimately I had a great time reading this. I absolutely loved how this book ended. I think Diane Chamberlain did a great job of bringing it all together and bringing about a resolution that was satisfactory, but also went really well with the plot as she had created it. I think right now I'm going to settle on like a four. If I gave quarter star ratings, it would probably be a 4.25. I don't know if I would go so far as to say it's a 4.5. I think I might have to sit with it a little just because of my dissatisfaction with Carly sometimes and some of the pacing issues that I had. I don't know if I can give it a 4.5, but I'm still thinking about the story after finishing it. I really enjoyed my reading experience and it is something that will certainly stick with me over time, you know? But anyway, y'all, those are my final thoughts on The Dream Daughter. I will go ahead and have one more clip in this vlog, kind of wrapping up my overall experience with these three books and putting an end to this project, which I've had a great time with, by the way. So I will check in with y'all later. All right, everyone. So I am here to officially wrap up the Can I Trust Sarah project that we've been doing over the past few weeks as I did finish the final book for the project the other day. So I thought I would just do kind of like a quick summary wrap up of my thoughts on the books, talk about which one I like the best, which one I like the least, and to make the ultimate determination of Can I Trust Sarah. So as a reminder, the very first book that I read for this project was Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll. And I really enjoyed this one. I had a great reading experience with it. This was my very first experience with Jessica Knoll, and I don't know if it would be my last although I don't think that I would go to her backlist because I've heard some pretty negative things about a couple of her more well-known thrillers. I really enjoyed Jessica Knoll's take on the Ted Bundy killings. I thought that she did a really great job of bringing a voice to the victim. My original thoughts on the book still stand in terms of like my lack of emotional connection to some of it and also I was really kind of upset by the fact that there wasn't any author's note or context given to the story. I would have liked to know a lot more about Jessica Knoll's thought process, why she wrote the story the way she did, what was real, what was not, you know, all of that good stuff. I really felt like this book was lacking because it did not have that. But overall, it was still incredibly, incredibly well written. So I give this a solid four stars. I'm glad that I ended up taking a chance and putting it on my TBR for Sarah to select because I don't know if I would have actually put this on my TBR had I not been hearing so many great things about this, even though in theory, it's like right up my alley, right? It's about serial killers, but I was a little bit nervous about putting it on my TBR. So I'm glad I got to it. I'm glad Sarah recommended it to me. And I'm happy to say that it was again, a four stars. And then we get to Life's Too Short by Abby Hammond. 
Ness and unfortunately this is definitely my least favorite book of the project and that is by far my biggest surprise of this project. I was thinking that this hands down was going to be my favorite but unfortunately it wasn't. I think after I finished reading this I gave this a 3.5 but in all honesty I think I'm going to downgrade this to a three stars. I think that this is officially my least favorite Abby Jimenez. This is definitely the Abby Jimenez couple that I have the least emotional connection and investment to. I had a lot of technical issues with the story overall and again you would have seen all of that in the clips before so I'm not really going to go into this. So it's getting a three stars which is really really disappointing. I didn't think she could do any wrong. I thought Just for the Summer was like a one-off and I was going to absolutely love everything that I ever read but this one not so much. Now I do recognize that this is an older release but yet I loved the two books that preceded this in the series so there really is no excuse for why I couldn't have loved this one just as much and unfortunately I didn't. And then of course we have The Dream Daughter by Diane Chamberlain and this is easily my favorite book of this project. I absolutely adored the story. I was compelled. I was captivated. I wanted to keep the pages turning. I do of course have those technical issues with it so this was not a perfect book by any means. In terms of my level of enjoyment and engagement this absolutely takes the top spot for this reading project. I really enjoyed Diane Chamberlain's take on time travel, the rules that she set for it and all of that stuff. I did find myself frustrated with the main character at points and there are definitely some things that are not relatable to me as a person who is child free by choice who actively chooses not to have a mother child relationship and doesn't necessarily understand it to the level as a lot of other people might experience it. That didn't stop me from really overall enjoying the story. If I had to settle on a rating right now I'd probably give it a 4.5 just because my feelings for this one are definitely stronger than a lot of the four star ratings that I've been giving to books recently including Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll. So I think for that reason I have to give this a 4.5 and this is definitely the star of this project. I think that this project was undoubtedly a success. The lowest rating that I gave was a three stars and nobody could have seen that coming, right? Sarah knows my love of Abby Jimenez and I was sure that I was going to love it. This would have been like a five star prediction for me. And so nobody is more surprised than me that it ended up being rated so lowly. So I absolutely do not blame Sarah for that at all. She was right on the money by selecting this book for me. Ultimately, it just didn't work out the way that I wanted. And thankfully the other two books were solid. And I definitely do still have high interest in reading the backups that she selected which was Wonderland by Jennifer Hillier as well as Drowning by TJ Newman. Those are still on my TBR and I will get to them eventually and I know that I will enjoy them both. This was a great time. I had a fantastic time with this project. I would love to do this again with Sarah or another booktube content creator because it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much to Sarah for recommending these books and for collaborating with me and I cannot wait to see what she thinks of the books that I chose for her. So until next time everybody, 